Uh, hello, everybody. Um, as Tom said, my name is Lincoln Bandlow. Uh, I'm a partner at Lathrop and Gage here in Los Angeles, uh, where I practice uh, intellectual property, defamation, privacy, and related matters. Um, I've had the privilege of speaking at Net Diligence both here and in Philadelphia a number of times, but I'm particularly excited about today's presentation for two reasons. Uh, first of all, I have the uh, pleasure to introduce a panel of brilliant attorneys who know virtually everything there is to know about big data and wrongful collection, whether it be claims or litigation or FTC regulation. Uh, and the second reason I'm excited is that as moderator, after I make those introductions, I have absolutely nothing to do whatsoever. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely up to that task today uh, because I couldn't add much to what this panel is going to add. So let us get started uh, right away. Uh, let me introduce the panel very quickly. You have their introductions, but I'll just give you a brief overview. Uh, we have immediately to my right, Emily Tabatabe. Did I get that right? Pretty close. Uh, she's a member of the Privacy, Data Security, and Internet Safety Group at the Oric Firm in Washington, D.C. She regularly advises clients on an array of consumer protection and privacy matters, including data privacy and security compliance and procedure, data breach responses, online privacy, mobile privacy, behavioral advertising, and the whole gamut. Um, to her right is Dominique Shelton, who is a litigation partner at Alston and Bird's Los Angeles office here. She focuses her practice on complex commercial litigation with particular attention on privacy litigation uh, and particularly matters relating to big data, etc. And then finally we have Christina Tucson, who is an attorney for the Federal Trade Commission in the Western Regional Office, again here in Los Angeles. Uh, she has prosecuted consumer protection cases. Uh, and previously worked as a Deputy Attorney General for the California Attorney General's Office. Uh, so let's start with uh, Emily, who will give us a sort of broad overview of big data and wrongful collection. Sure. Thank you, Lincoln. Is this working? Anybody? Okay, there we go. Um, oh, well, there's our bios, which we this. Okay, so big data. Um, first of all, really, what is it? It's a word that gets bandied about a lot lately, and everyone's talking about it, but at its core, uh, big data is really just the collection of enormous data sets that you analyze, chop, dice, whatever, um, to, to reveal um, patterns and inferences about human behavior. So big data has a lot of benefits for companies. In fact, McKinsey and Company just recently um, uh, estimated that big data can increase retail profits by up to 60%. That's huge. Um, the effective management of data sets can help companies achieve efficiencies. Um, respond to market demands and micro-market demands, and you can slice your, your market segments even smaller than you had before. Um, obviously, customize offerings to particular uh, and specific customer groups. It's incredibly valuable for companies. Uh, some companies are actually able to turn big data into competitive advantage or to a perceived benefit for their customers. So, I think we've all been on Amazon, when, which is very, very effective at selling you a new product based on the things that have already been in your shopping cart. Um, Lowe's has also had a very effective ad campaign, um, how it's the, uh, the only big box home improvement store that can remember what type of paint you bought five years ago. So when little Timmy drove a hole through your wall and you need to, you know, patch, um, go to Lowe's, they remember all of your data. <clears throat> I, I assure you that the data that Lowe's remembers is more beneficial for Lowe's than it is for the consumer, but they've managed to pack as, package it up as a benefit. Uh, there are some risks of big data as well, and I think first and foremost, we can all think about the creep factor. So um, the, the amount of data analysis is, is um, incredible these days what they can come up with. Uh, recently, Microsoft researchers have announced that they can tell with um, pretty, pretty specific, they can be pretty specific about the risk of one of their users going to a hospital uh, based on search terms that they've input into a search engine. Microsoft has said that they're not actually going to act on it because it would be awfully creepy if your search engine house had a pop-up that was like, give me to the hospital, you're having a heart attack. <laughs> um, so, so they're not going to do anything about it because that would creep out their user base. But the fact that they can is really telling. Um, there's also a problem of personalization of content. And as the FTC has recently uh, announced, uh, it's pretty obvious that the personalization of content can lead to discriminatory impact against certain groups. 
So most data brokers will slice and dice data up into groups that have uh, similarities of racial content, um, ethnic groups, socioeconomic um, bands, and uh, the ability to customize content into those particular segments could be damaging in sensitive groups. Uh, there's also the problem that aggregated data, which big data companies are collecting, uh, they collect in aggregate form so as to try to avoid a lot of privacy and security concerns. Aggregate data may no longer be aggregate. There's a whole cottage industry of mathematicians out there whose um, hobby in life has been to re-identify supposedly anonymous data sets, and it's becoming easier and easier to do. Data quality risks associated with big data, and there's quite a few. One, data gets stale very, very quickly, particularly things like location data. Um, I was doing a lot of internet searches to try to get flights out to LAX last week to come out here and speak. Uh, now, if I'm getting advertisements about airfare to LA, I'm no longer going to need that information. Not only that, but algorithms aren't infallible. As smart as they can be, they can also give you really inaccurate conclusions. Case in point, yesterday I went to Google to try to see how Google has market segmented me recently. In addition to noting, noting that my interests include business and travel, accurate, um, it also identified me as being particularly interested in East Asian music and in shooter games. Now, I don't know what a shooter game is. I can assure you I'm not all that interested in it. Um, so anybody who's trying to sell me a product based on that segmentation is going to be pretty disappointed. Um, another problem with big data is that subjects are not verifying their data, so you really have no way for a data subject to verify the authenticity of it. And that really takes away from, um, from its usefulness. So there are quite a few legal risks associated with big data. Um, for the most part, the standard um, data rules, laws, regulations, and best practices that apply to the collection of um, any uh, data is going to apply to big data as well. There's really no fundamental difference. However, there are a couple of um, reasons that big data presents some unique challenges and some unique um, risks. So one of the fundamental um, uh, uh, concepts of data privacy and protection in the United States is this notice of transparency, uh, uh, this concept of transparency and notice. You're supposed to give um, effective uh, and, and um, useful notice so that the consumers who are providing you data understand how that data is being collected and how it's being used. There's a difficulty in providing effective notice when you're talking about big data sets. For one, who reads privacy policies? We all know that no one actually reads them, and I write a lot of them, and I'm quite confident in knowing that very few people actually read the ones that I write. Um, not only that, we all know about the problems of uh, of uh, providing effective notice on a mobile device. So if you weren't going to read a privacy policy on a browser, you're certainly not going to read it on your browser that's this big. Um, big data has become so useful and so cheap and easy to collect that a lot of companies are now collecting data um, with the idea of figuring out how they're going to monetize it later. So if a company is collecting data in mass, they're just collecting and storing everything they can get their hands on, and the company itself doesn't even know how it's going to use it, how can it provide effective notice to the consumer at the point of collection? And the answer is they really can't. In the U.S., we get by by saying we're collecting your information to use for marketing purposes and then providing absolutely no uh, uh, notice beyond that. Um, and it's okay, but it's really not giving consumers a whole lot of choice. Consent and choice is something else that's really fundamental to our privacy laws in the United States, and it's very difficult when we're talking about big data. Even if you do provide effective notice, and let's say your privacy policy is excellent and someone bothers to read it, it's unclear that a data subject has a realistic understanding of what she's consenting to. So let's say I go on a website and consent to have my, um, my, my transaction history and my bank card um, shared with third parties for marketing purposes. Well, what if my bank card shows that I eat at McDonald's every, every day? And then what if that information is sold to a data broker who then slots me into a market segment of uh, fast food eaters or frequent fast food eaters? And then what happens if that data segment is then sold to somebody who's trying to sell me insurance and, and determines that I'm actually pretty high risk? There's no way that me as a consumer agreeing to share my data for marketing purposes has a true understanding of what the implications of that consent could possibly be. So if that's the case, is that really um, sufficient choice that I have when I'm evaluating my choices? It, it's unclear. Uh, not only that, but consumers also don't really have the opportunity to opt out once they do make the consent, once they give the consent to share their data, they have almost no opportunity to claw it back at a later point. 
Data security is obviously going to be a big risk. The more data you collect, the more your risk of theft and loss. Um, the FTC and, uh, and private class action have been very aggressive in trying to enforce um, and enforce in this area and try to protect consumers. And my colleagues are going to talk about that in, in a few minutes. Well, but, and Emily, the, the issue of opt-out is not universal either, correct, with Europe being a totally different standard. Absolutely. So right now I'm really talking about a U.S. perspective, but you're absolutely right. Um, Europe really requires or, or looks for an opt-in consent to share data for marketing purposes. And in many instances, companies are not providing that at all. So there's also the risk of collecting um, what's called sensitive data. And I think we've all talked a lot about breach here. So we all know that credit card numbers, bank account numbers, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, the collection of that for any purpose really presents um, a much higher risk because if you lose that, then you're going to trigger all the state breach notification laws. Um, most companies who are collecting data because they can aren't really aware or, 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 or we're not, are not really cognizant of those risks at all or really what they could mean. Um, sensitive data, particularly related to children, you've got federal laws, COPPA and FERPA that relate to the collection of information from children and from students. There are federal regs about how you can collect that information and what kind of consent you need to collect the information. And with regards to COPPA, that consent is really a sliding scale based on how one wants to use the data. So if you're collecting information from kids and you're going to use it to send newsletters or uh, just to operate your own website, you can have a much lower level of parental uh, consent in order to be able to do that. But the moment you want to take that data, mark it back to the kids, give it to a third party who wants to mark it back to the kids, um, or share it broadly on the internet, um, you need a much higher level of parental consent, verifiable parental consent, in fact. And that, that's a very, very high standard. So one has to be very careful when you're using children's data to ensure that you're not later using it for a purpose that you aren't allowed to use it for if you haven't obtained the appropriate consents. Um, there's also a bunch of state laws with regard to, to marketing towards children that you need to be careful of. So if the data is being collected, sold, packaged, and resold, and then someone wants to use it to market um, firearms, tobacco, alcohol, uh, tattoos, and you want to market to kids, well, you may actually be in violation of California state law, for example. Um, health data. I think we all know what HIPAA is, or at least you kind of know of it. Um, there's a lot of ways that data brokers can collect health information about you that has nothing to do with getting information from your healthcare provider. So they can collect information from uh, mobile apps, from your pharmacy purchases, from your Fitbit. All of this information could give a lot of insights about your, your health. And most privacy advocates in the United States, and certainly in Europe as well, consider health data to be sensitive and require a higher level of notice and consent and potentially even opt-in consent for a user to then collect the information, the sensitive health info, and use it for certain purposes like marketing. It's not clear at all that big data providers and, and companies are getting that level of consent at all. Finally, I want to talk about a couple of industry-specific risks before we go on to some of the enforcement actions. Um, the, te the educational technology sector is really fraught with risk these days. Uh, 36 different legislators introduced um, uh, statutes this year alone. Not all of them have passed for sure, but certainly some have. California, for example, now prohibits compiling data beyond what's needed to provide the services to the school. So if you're collecting information from a bunch of students, you are really prohibited from using that information for marketing, to compile profiles or dossiers, to sell that information to third parties further. You've always got to be aware of how the information is being collected before you can evaluate whether or not you can share it and use it for certain purposes. Financial institutions, that's another area where there's a lot of legal risk. Um, financial institutions are required under Graham Leach Bliley to make certain disclosures about who they're sharing information with, for what purposes, what information is being shared, whether the consumer has the right to opt out of it. Um, and, and financial institutions will also impose certain um, contractual requirements on their vendors as well. So if you're a vendor serving a financial institution and you plan on uh, doing a lot of analysis with these massive data sets, you've got to be very careful not only of not violating federal law, but also of contractual provisions that your financial institution may put in place. Um, and finally, um, FICRA, which I think that we're also going to talk about later, but I wanted to hit on that. Um, FICRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, well, it's a federal law that, that uh, places restrictions on how one can amass 
um, profile data, usually compiled by big data brokers, and then use that data for the purpose of evaluating someone's creditworthiness or their eligibility for employment. So some data brokers are now getting into trouble for amassing profile data and creating um, very detailed uh, reports on an individual, which is perfectly legal perhaps, um, but then selling it to a third party user who uses it for one of those two purposes, employment eligibility or creditworthiness. And if the data is going to be used for those purposes, then all of a sudden both parties need to comply with all the different requirements that FICRA offers. So there's, there's quite a lot of minefields, and now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to discuss some of the more litigious values that we're seeing right now. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, very, very helpful. And what we're going to talk about now a little bit is what's going on in the litigation front, um, just to sort of underscore the importance that this uh, area is having with respect to regulators and um, uh, right now, I just want to take the month of May of this year as a snapshot in time to give you a sense of to what degree um, uh, regulators are really and uh, legislators are really focused on this issue of big data. So we had five uh, big data reports that came out, two from President Obama's White House, um, and then two weeks later on May 15th, the Senate um, held two hours worth of hearings and issued I think an 80-page report about um, the transparency issue as it relates to data brokers and uh, the types of things, best practices that companies should enter in, into if they are working with a data broker or um, if they are a data broker themselves. And then on May 21st, our California State AG came out with um, her report, Making Your Privacy Practices Public, uh, which gives guidance um, to companies about the disclosures that they should have in place to communicate with consumers about what data, is, um, what so called big data, is actually being collected in terms of tracking. And um, that all ties into the amendments to the California's Online Privacy Protection Act that went into effect on January 1st. And this guide was a way to help educate companies about how to make their privacy notices um, basically more readable and actually more transparent with respect to what they're doing with big data. And then uh, immediately following that, we had um, on May 27th the uh, FTC's data broker report that came out. So uh, just to, uh, the, the takeaway here, I mean, um, these are just the face pages of those different um, reports, but the takeaway here is that regulators care about this, uh, they are focused on it, legislators are talking about it, and um, if you are advising companies that are in this, you should also know that um, this is not just an area for regulators and legislators, that um, class actions um, have, have resulted from big data related activity. And so I was here last year around this time and I talked to you about the class actions that were um, going on around the country. We now have 195 behavioral tracking class actions and I think last year, uh, I'm not sure if I had a chance to tell you that um, the, the uh, Comscore decision had been affirmed by the Seventh Circuit on June 11th, meaning that, um, first of all, let me just point you to this map. This is just gives you, it's hard to read, but when you get to um, look at the hard copy of the slides, you'll see that 108 of those class actions are right here in California. So, <clears throat> doesn't mean they're not in other places too, but just understand that California is an area where a lot of the uh, class actions are being filed. They are not being filed as behavioral tracking class actions or do not track class actions, although increasingly we're seeing more and more of these guidance documents that I pointed you to on um, the earlier slide being cited in the complaints that are being filed in big data. So guidance documents and uh, sort of proclama proclamations that are not law that are being promulgated by the FTC, the California State AG, and um, the uh, President Obama's White House are finding their way in uh, complaints, in class action complaints, as background, not as um, predicate acts for any unlawful conduct, or not as a claim themselves, but just a sort of background and, and standard setting about what a company should be doing with big data. So just be aware of that, and that's why it's so important that you touch on the, the um, guidance documents that uh, were just Emily just talked about earlier. Um, also, I will just um, point out that uh, of these uh, big data class actions, about 62% of them have involved big data companies. So um, if you are advising or insuring a company that is a big data company or involved in analytics, 
Um, for example, a, a company like uh, Comscore, for example, that ended up with a 10 million user class certified um, under the Stored Communications Act at $10,000 per violation, and that decision was affirmed by the Seventh Circuit on June 11th, opening up um, a $1 billion exposure for a, um, for a publicly traded company. And I wanted to just kind of loop back to something I said earlier. These complaints often do not come uh, wearing the label, do not track, so that you know to pay attention to them, like on our map. They're often um, just causes of action under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the Stored Communications Act, the Wiretap Act, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the State Computer Trespass Laws. Um, so don't um, assume that you'll just be able to, to be able to know right away that these are tracking cases until you read the cases and you're sensitized to the issues that um, we're talking about here. I won't spend a lot of time on the, the uh, Comscore slides just to tell you that that, um, that was what it was, which was a $1 billion exposure. Um, that case ended up being settled on you know, pretty good terms for $14 million, um, in May of this year or so. But again, if you're a shareholder and um, you're with a publicly traded um, company and you don't realize that big data can uh, result in any liability at all, and if privacy council are not sitting together with SEC council to talk about making the appropriate disclosures, um, it's easy for these cases to get sometimes uh, sort of ride underneath the, the radar screen creating issues, um, as, as, um, it, as was alluded to in the earlier presentation, the SEC has become very interested in um, privacy in general, big data also, and so um, you know, creating SEC issues and also class action um, exposure. There are a couple cases that have come down that are interesting. Um, the Enri Zinia case at least is one promising um, case for, for companies that, um, uh, the people, uh, attorneys who are representing um, or defending companies in class actions and also insurers that are representing companies um, or insuring companies in class actions. In that case, what the court said was that um, the plaintiffs have alleged that just having a referrer header, that basically um, the browser header of a particular page being disclosed to an analytic company, um, that that constituted a violation of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, both under the Wiretap and Stored Communications Act, and um, the court said no, that's not the case. It's not those two. Um, those two provisions only prohibit uh, disclosing the contents of communications. And looking at a watch page does not, you know, having a referrer header that could lead you to a watch page does not uh, does not disclose the content of the communication. And that was a decision by the Ninth Circuit um, in May. The, but the bottom line is, um, for those of you who are counseling companies, um, they, you know, outside of the litigation context, really getting a handle on what it is that a website is collecting or the, what uh, data a mobile app is collecting is very important. And you can't just rely on, say, your marketing teams, your IT teams. I can't tell you the number of conversations that I'm sure, you know, uh, those of us on the panel. Um, that we sat through where we've asked the question, um, what, are you using tracking technologies? Are you using cookies? Are you using unique device identifiers? If you're in a mobile app, are you using device tokens to uh, push, uh, send out push notifications, the flash cookies, um, uh, iBeacons now for tracking purposes now that that's in the new iOS um, 8 software. When we ask those questions, we often get the answer, no, that's not happening. So it's helpful and useful um, for you to have some way to at least start a, a deeper analysis and dialogue. And um, one option that I, I use a lot, um, it's free, if it's easy to download, is the Ghostery tool that you can just put on Chrome and stick at least a URL, not a mobile app. Um, that's not available on the free license, but um, you can stick a URL in and just get a sense of the amount of tracking activity that's going on. Um, and so that you can start a coaching conversation with um, who you're working with. I just want to point out um, that the VPPA, I won't spend a lot of time on these slides, but I just want to um, kind of point you to a few things. The VPPA has become uh, essentially, the, the, because of the Hulu litigation, um, an area where a lot of the plaintiffs' counsel are starting to focus and they're using, uh, this is their way to get a behavioral tracking uh, related to videos that are on a particular website or a mobile app or a television app. So um, in the Hulu case, that involved a website that allegedly was disclosing um, personally identifiable information as it relates to how that is defined under the Video Privacy Protection Act 
which is um, any any communication that commu that identifies a specific person as requesting any specific audio video materials. And uh, that act was actually enacted in 1988 to deal with um, the disclosure of Judge Bork. Uh, Judge Bork's actual videos um, that he had, and he and his family had rented while he was uh, up for nomination the year prior in 1987 for the Supreme Court. Uh, there was nothing, he, Judge Bork actually joked that the, the only thing that happened when a, a, a city newspaper uh, reporter in D.C. had, you know, uh, written about all of the, uh, the uh, videos that he actually reviewed, he joked that it just showed that he was, had such boring tastes and there was nothing really, you know, um, juicy in those uh, videos, but still Congress felt that it was an invasion of privacy and so they defined um, the way personally identifiable information is defined under the VPPA is different than many of the data breach uh, notification laws. Um, as it relates to audio, video materials, and that's not typically covered under any um, state data breach law that I'm aware of. Um, in any event, this has liquidated damages of $2,500 per violation available, and um, in Hulu, they've made it past two motions to dismiss, two motions for summary judgment. Most recently in June, um, the, the first class action motion was denied, but the case is um, being rebriefed, and for, uh, I think, uh, I believe this month, um, it's being rebriefed uh, for uh, uh, class certification on the issue of whether the Facebook login um, is personally identifying, um, uh, th whether there can be a class based on the Facebook uh, login where you have a Facebook like button placed underneath a piece of video and because the Facebook cookies operate to actually grab the referrer header and link that with a Facebook ID, um, the, Hulu, the Northern District of, of uh, California um, Magistrate Judge Beeler concluded that that constituted a specific enough identification of a person's audio video viewing materials to make it past summary judgment. Dominique, didn't Netflix get involved in some of this kind of litigation as well? Yes, um, Netflix had that, but it was a slightly different situation because it had to do with the link. Two issues, one was disclosure um, with respect to Facebook and the other um, this, the Netflix case was about three years prior, and the other piece was related to the length of time they were retaining the data, which is another provision of the Video Privacy Protection Act. And basically, um, what the what the court has what the courts have said is that there's no private right of action for the um, if any longer anyway. It's pretty much consensus with all the circuits that there's no private right of action with respect to holding on to the data longer um, than the um, one year after an account is closed. But with respect to the disclosure claims, that those claims can continue to be brought, and they are being brought. Um, that since the Hulu, the Hulu case has made traction, it's been pending for the past three years, we've seen um, about six different uh, class actions filed. Uh, Perry versus Cable News, just literally on October 8th in the Ellis versus Cartoon Network case, um, the court, uh, the Northern District Court of Georgia dismissed that case with prejudice, and that was based on disclosing um, a, an Android ID plus specific viewing materials, and the court said that unlike a Facebook ID, which it can potentially specifically identify a person and is more akin to a name and an address, that um, the Ellis, uh, the the type of disclosure of issue in the Ellis case, which was an Android ID plus video viewing, was not sufficient to identify a person. Um, Wall Street Journal has been sued, ESPN has been sued, Disney has been sued, and most recently on August 22nd, we knew this was going to happen. Um, the AMC was sued. We didn't know AMC was specifically going to be sued, but we did know that the plaintiffs' counsel were going to start tailoring their complaints to mirror basically the summary judgment ruling that the Hulu court made in April of 2014, basically concluding that a Facebook ID is enough to identify a person, and if that, um, if a like button is contained underneath video, that that is sufficient to um, trigger potential VPPA liability. Well, this August 22nd um, complaint reads almost like a reread of the uh, Magistrate Judge Buehler's decision in April of 2014. Just want to give you a sense of where the VPPA cases are pending. Um, they're right now in California, Washington, Illinois, Georgia, and um, Northern uh, and New York. Excuse me. Um, there's all we can talk about compliance later offline, but there are ways the VPPA actually permits um, companies to obtain consent in advance for up to two years in advance, and you can do that electronically. That's an amendment that went into effect. You certainly want to 
um, if you're counseling or you're an insurer, you want to definitely be able to um, start counseling clients about these issues. I will also note that many of those cases that I just went through earlier involve mobile apps. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on uh, big data and mobile other than to, to sort of mirror what um, Emily just said, that a lot of data is collected um, through mobile devices and then backed up on clouds. Uh, you can think about the Apple breach and some other things, many things that do not rise to the level of being um, personal information under data breach laws are still nonetheless finding themselves either causing uh, damage to the brand or exposure in class action activity, and that includes cookie data, unique device identifiers. I read an article uh, a couple days ago that the cookie is dead, but um, that that's the end of it, that most companies are now moving to unique device identifiers, and, um, you'll, and we start seeing that already with the iOS um, 8, uh, the, the, some of the iOS 8 um, I mean, uh, um, new features um, calling for app developers to use iBeacons instead of um, unique device identifiers and preventing uh, the sort of tracking through location uh, and Wi-Fi ping technology, which is what a lot of other apps were doing previously. Um, I will just say that uh, security is an issue that you should also be aware of with respect to mobile apps. It's not just the big... Um, it's not just the big data, it's um, also security issues relating to it. So I think I'm out of time here, but the, um, the Fandango settlement, um, which just was announced in March, is another example. Um, just in terms of a practice pointer, I will say that there are many things that companies can do to help mitigate the risks associated with a big data or the class actions that we've talked about here involving mobile apps, big data, or video. And that's to follow some of the guidance that the FTC and the California State AG have put out regarding what can be done to make uh, consumer disclosures more transparent and more visible. Using icons is a, a, um, a way that um, the FTC and the California State AG have encouraged companies to make their uh, privacy disclosures more readable. The use of short form notice in connection with um, mobile apps, that has also been encouraged. Uh, each of the different agencies, the FTC, the California State AG, and the Article 29 Working Group in the EU, Canada, have all developed different data sets that they think, uh, and some of them overlap and some of them are different, that they think are important to include in a short form notice that is not buried, quote unquote, in a privacy policy and actually um, is pushed out in a mobile app in a short form uh, succinct disclosure with short legal explanations and icons. Um, any company and should really consider getting that all together in one checklist. We've done that at our firm, but I'm sure um, many firms are doing that right now. We've identified like 32 data sets that will um, actually trigger short form notice. The use of icons also very important. Um, different companies have developed different icons, um, and there's not really a uniform standard. Our firm has developed icons, but other, uh, you know, trustee has some and, and others, but that's a very easy thing to do to help show that you're making your, um, your, uh, your disclosures as, as transparent as possible. And then finally, I will just say, I was just in France um, last week, and the data privacy, uh, data protection authority, Front Florence Reynal, talked about the cookie suite that occurred the week of um, September 15th and indicated that there will be additional um, enforcement activities this month in October, starting this month in October. It wasn't just France that was engaged in the cookie suite, there were actually seven other countries involved in that. There will be um, some announcement of the, com um, of the, the, um, the companies that were not in compliance with the, the cookie directive. So as I stated earlier, explicit consent is needed for cookie um, collection or any tracking technology collection in the EU. But what they were sweeping about and what they were checking on is that many companies have, um, the cookies will just be deposited on a user's browser as soon as they arrive on the site. So what they wanted to see is to make sure that the, that, um, the explicit consent, which has now been sort of consensus, there was a Spanish Data Protection Authority ruling and a Netherlands ruling that concluded that um, implied, you, you, if there was a banner notice that explained by uh, continuing to use the site, you are agreeing to the collection of cookies, that that would be sufficient to satisfy the EU cookie directive. What the sweep was about was the fact that many of the cookies are deposited immediately without giving the time even for the banner ad to appear and the 
the activity that would consider, be considered implied consent, like continuing to browse the site, not giving the user the opportunity to do that. So um, the practical uh, suggestion I would have for all of you here is know what you're collecting, use tools like Ghostery or uh, Trustee, many of them have other um, things. Um, get developed governance around your big data, look at security, and train, and um, make sure that you've, you've uh, trained all of the relevant people. Let's move on now to uh, FTC regulation in this area. Thank you. All right, so uh, I have a lot of slides to get through, so I probably uh, will we'll skim through a number of them, but the information is certainly there for your background for future uh, review. I thought I'd better more information than less, uh, as, most, as most lawyers like to think. Um, so the FTC, as most of you know, is an independent agency that focuses on consumer protection, uh, particularly in the area of privacy, both through law enforcement, education and guidance, and through policy recommendations. Um, we recently issued a report on data brokers, and we found in that report that businesses are collecting more personal information about consumers than ever before. Um, and of course, they're storing that sometimes indefinitely and transmitting it through their own systems as well as the internet. But as all of you know, with recent publicity, there are a number of breaches, including Target, Neiman Marcus, Michael Stores, and many more, um, that show that these systems are susceptible to compromise. And of course, hackers are exploiting vulnerabilities in these systems to access consumer-sensitive information and potentially misuse this information in ways to uh, both harm consumers and businesses. Uh, we're seeing this, of course, with not only credit card information, but with social security numbers, account passwords, health data, information about children, and, of course, other types of personal information. Um, this is particularly important in, in light of the real threat of, threat of identity theft. Uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics estimate that 16.6 .6 million people, or 7% of all U.S. residents age 16 and older, were victims of identity theft in 2012 alone. Uh, it's been a top consumer complaint for the FTC for 13 consecutive years, and tax identity theft, which often begins by the obtaining of social security numbers, has been an increasing share of our identity theft complaints, where they'll actually take your social security number and file your taxes before you do, and get a refund um, for things you never knew that you had. Um, you know, m multiple write-offs, multiple children, things, things that you don't have, you, you, they, they get that before you even do, do your filing. Um, so it's been our mission to protect consumer privacy and promote data security. Um, and as part of that, we've settled a number of law enforcement cases, um, 50 uh, since 2002 alone. So the tools that we use for our law enforcement cases are, of course, our uh, Section 5 of the FTC Act, uh, which broadly prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices affecting commerce. Um, deception is defined to be a material misrepresentation or omission that's likely to mislead consumers who are acting reasonably. And under the unfairness prong, um, we, we brought cases on, on data breaches under both of these prongs, but under the unfairness prong, it's defined as a practice that's likely to cause substantial injury to the consumers and not reasonably outweighed by countervailing benefits to the consumer competition. So, um, you know, it's sort of hard to establish a, a benefit for a data breach uh, that, that would be outweighed or a reason not to do it, but those are the standards under unfairness. And it's, it's a flexible law that's applied in a number of different um, situations. So our sort of general principles are in compliance, of course, you want to handle your information consistent with your promises. Um, if your privacy policy says you're going to, um, you know, delete data after a certain time period or you won't share it or you'll only share it in certain circumstances, of course, you need to follow those um, promises that you make. And of course, avoiding practices that create an unreasonable risk to harm the consumer data, like making it susceptible to a breach. Um, in addition to, to Section 5, there are of course other uh, federal laws that are out there that, and, and rules, including the Red Flags Rules, Safeguards Rule, Fair Credit Reporting Act, and the um, and, and COPPA, which I won't spend a lot of time on. So I'll go into some of the cases that we filed. Um, Here's just a sample of a couple of the uh, companies that we've sued, um, you know, in the last several years for issues related to um, data and privacy security breaches. As I mentioned earlier, we've had 50 data security set settlements. Um, these involve uh, breaches of the social security numbers, health data, data about children, credit card and bank account information, users and passwords. And it was across a broad range of sectors and platforms, including retail, financial, mobile, and social media. So 
So our guiding principles are, of course, that security must be appropriate in light of the circumstances. Um, a breach doesn't necessarily mean that your uh, security wasn't reasonable. It doesn't create an action just because there's a breach. It doesn't mean you haven't sort of done everything you should have. Um, by the same token, just because there isn't a breach, it also doesn't mean your security measures are up, up to par. Um, data security should be an ongoing process um, where, you know, people are really looking at how their data is managed and, and how uh, they're taking care of it to ensure it's not subject to a breach. Um, we recommend that people look at all platforms, you look at the web, mobile, internal systems, um, you know, the cost of the available tools that you have to improve security and reduce vulnerabilities, size and complexity of the business are taken into account, um, as well as the sensitivity and volume of the information that the uh, company is holding. And again, we're not suggesting that companies need to have perfect security, um, but you do need to look at these factors and really be assessing the risks and addressing the risks as they, as they come about. So some common privacy failures that we see are um, you know, rolling out a new service or feature that increases sharing without adequate notice or consent. So you may have people who were given a particular notice and have agreed to a certain type of consent, and then something new is rolled out without getting the consent from those consumers for a new feature or a new, a new product, um, a new sharing mechanism that they wouldn't necessarily agree to. Others are misrepresenting with uh, the way that the data is being shared. So uh, consumers may think, oh, it's being used for marketing purposes internally, but later to find out it could be shared with insurance providers or other um, entities for whom they probably might want not want them to know that they like to go hang gliding on a regular basis. Um, misrepresentations about tracking and opting out of tracking is another issue that we see. And of course, presenting false choices. So a consumer may be led to think, click this box, and in fact, you will be protected um, from having information shared, or it will only be used for this purpose. And ultimately, it's just not the case in terms of how it's actually being used. Uh, a couple of cases we brought under Section 5 for deception include um, Fandango and Credit Karma. Those are mobile security cases in 2014. Um, Gene Wizard, which was um, an emphasis on security providers. There we allege that there were no reasonable policies or procedures to protect people's um, personal information, that there was no contract that service providers implemented to main sa maintain safeguards for personal information. There was no reasonable oversight of service providers, and that they didn't use readily available security measures to limit wireless access to the network. So we are certainly looking at, you know, is, you know, what were your options at the time, and certainly where there is a reasonable option for security and a company chooses not to implement that, um, that certainly can create an issue. Um, PLS Financial Services was a case in 2012. Um, that was a, we had an emphasis on disposal and training where there was a payday lender and check cashing company. And we allege that they didn't properly dispose of information, dispose of information such that it could be reconstructed. Um, and so, in addition, they didn't sufficiently train or vet employees who were involved in transportation and handling of, of the materials. Um, they didn't alert employees about the um, sensitive nature of the information or instruct employees how to take precautions. So, um, certainly, all the training is involved, and in making the employees aware that they've got sensitive data is, is certainly a, a key issue. Um, again, ultimately, there wasn't a proper overseeing of the d disposal of information. Christina, we're running a little low on time. Sure. Can, you, can you jump ahead yeah, to best data ahead. security practices? Absolutely. Because I think that's something this group would want to hear sure. above all else. It's a lot of stuff. I'm just kidding. It'll be there. All right. So, uh, so here's just a couple of examples of best practices. Um, these are four points we say that, that sort of guide it, but of course it's an ongoing process. Just because you have something in place initially doesn't mean that that's sort of the ultimate, um, you know, sort of be all end all. The procedures must be reasonable and appropriate. You need to be constantly evaluating whether that changes over time as your products or practices change. Again, as we said, the breach doesn't necessarily show failure, but the issue is really reasonableness. And it could also be subject to a, a violation of the FTC Act, even if there is no breach, if you really have a, a really um, a, a, a security set of measures that's really subject to breach could stop being properly handled. So, of course, we want you to take stock, you know, know what you have in your files on your computers. Um, if you have franchisees, other entities who have access to your computer, you really want to know about that. Um, keep only what you need. Uh, protect the information that you keep, both physically and, of course, electronically. Dispose of what's not needed, and plan ahead. You know, 
just because you don't think you'll have a security incident, you do need to have a plan in place in case you do for physical, electronic, and employee training and oversight of service providers. Um, again, there are websites and other places, um, as Dominique mentioned, that you can go to look into to ensure you're assessing security vulnerabilities. We have a number of um, handouts or uh, information on our website. Some of them are linked here about how you can reduce your risk. Uh, on the FTC website, we have a whole set of guidelines for business on the security area and other areas as well that are available. Um, again, look at your computers or servers where the information is being stored. Identify the connections. Um, if, if there is some outside entity that's getting, you know, you, you have you know, 50 franchisees and they're all connected to a mainframe and they have access to everybody else's information, when they may not need to, it's something you might want to think about because you're creating a vulnerability in all those areas for information that that entity might not need. Uh, don't set, store sensitive data with the internet connection unless it's essential, of course. Encrypting data, we've had a number of cases where the encryption was not proper. Um, again, email encryption internally is important. Um, and of course, anti-spyware. Uh, finally, ch check websites that have uh, policies for installing vendor-proof patches, uh, look at download authorization, do regular scanning, and SLS, secure connection information. Um, keep in mind that just because you think your entity may be doing everything right, you really need to also be aware of who you're contracting with and who your service providers are. So you really do need to, to do an analysis as to whether, um, if you're outsourcing business functions where they have this information available to them through your company, um, it's important to ensure that they are implementing proper security procedures as they receive your information. And of course, notify you if they have security incidents involving your data. Um, again, this is sort of the incident response plan to ensure that there is somebody that's designated as being responsible for handling security breaches, immediately dealing with compromised uh, computers, investigating incidents immediately, and both making sure you're notifying inside and outside sources of data breaches. So um, finally, you take stock about consumer notification, law enforcement, credit bureaus, and other entities you need to notify about possible breach, breaches. So we do recommend you really are sure you're handling it. Um, it's not, not something to sweep under the rug, certainly, um, but that the incident is handled appropriately, and that's certainly something we look at. Uh, again, outsourcing, as we said, there is, you have responsibility for outsourcing of your data, so it's really important that you are ensure that, ensuring that they are properly handling your data, even if it's an offshore entity. We, we issued a data broker's report, I mentioned earlier, that analyzed nine data brokers. Um, it's it's uh, aggregated information about those brokers, but we basically uh, issued requests for information from them and aggregated information. Um, we really learned that you know, the data brokers, as we've discussed, combine and analyze a number of different data points about consumers. And the consumers really don't understand that they have a choice to prohibit these data brokers from gathering their information. Um, most of them, as we've discussed, don't even know it's being gathered. It's so many data points that somebody sort of knows everything about them in, in a variety of ways they may not want people to know, and that that information could be used in ways that are, that are potentially harmful to them. So, you know, other findings we report were that brokers also are sharing between each other. So it's not just one broker who's got your data that's that minded from one place. They may be sharing large data brokers or even medium sized are sharing amongst themselves, combining all sorts of different data data types and really getting detailed information as we talked about it. This is the income, religion, political leanings, um, really a whole number of things that consumers might not be pleased to have shared, um, you know, with whoever they may, be, they may be ultimately shared with. So, again, we also talk about how you shouldn't be, you know, that there's concern about storing consumers' data indefinitely, which can create some security risks. Um, also, if they're offering choices about the data, they're largely in, in, invisible or incomplete. Uh, here's our website where you can find more information about sort of protecting consumer privacy and things that we recommend. You can also find our data brokerage reports, certainly. Time for one question, Tom? Yeah, do you have one? Yes, okay. Uh, we, have, we went a little bit over, but if we have time for maybe one or two questions here to, for this panel, if anybody has any. Anything going once. I don't have any GoPros to give away. I only have questions. Okay, that's not it. Uh, thank the panel very much.